And, and he has, I think, opened the door for those vast swaths of humanity in primarily the, 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 the developed world uh, to take religion seriously again. And not only religion in general, but biblical religion and Christianity in particular. He's a jealous deity, and if you don't love me, then I'm not going to love you back. It's like false. That has nothing to do with the biblical conception of God, even though you hear that all the time from people who've never actually read the Bible. It is that this is how you will be happy. This is how you will be whole. I can't do that for you. It's like a parent to a child, right? I want you to be happy. I can't make you happy. This is how you can be happy if you freely choose it. Hi, and welcome to And If Love Remains. I'm your host, Mike Levitt, and I have on the line today a very special author, um, Matthew R. Petrusik. Um, Matthew is Associate Professor of Theology Ethics at Loyal Marymount University, and also currently serves as a fellow of the Word on Fire Institute. In addition to numerous scholarly and, and popular articles, he is co-editor of the book Value and Vulnerability, an Interfaith Dialogue on Human Dignity. He lectures widely on theological, philosophical, and ethical issues in English and Spanish, and has served as an on-air analyst for uh, Natosius, Natosius, I'm sorry, Mundo Fox, and <laughs> CNN in Espanol. Welcome to the show, Matthew. I really appreciate you being on. Thanks, Mike. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. And, and we're going to talk about your newest book that you co-authored, um, uh, called Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity. And I'm, I'm very excited to get into this book. I've been, I've been reading through parts of it. It's, it's, it's an incredible book and, and goes into a lot of questions that, that I have, um, concerning, uh, Jordan Peterson. So I'm, it's pretty, I think it's a very timely book. Um, but before we do that, let me ask you about yourself. Like, uh, where did you come from and, and how did you get into, um, you know, theology and, 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 and wanting to make this kind of your life work. Yeah, sure. So I, uh, I'm originally from the state of Oregon. I grew up in a, in a small town in, in Northeastern Oregon. And um, I didn't know that there was such a thing as theology to be studied uh, for most of my, my young life. Um, my parents raised me Catholic and I always, I was one of those rare kids that actually looked forward to going to church. So there was never an issue uh, with, um, with uh, church attendance itself. I just didn't know really what, what theology, uh, what theology was, uh, in college, I, I went to a small school in Virginia called Washington and Lee university. I wanted a totally different experience from growing up in Northeastern Oregon. And I found it in, in <laughs> Southwestern Virginia. Uh, but it was, it was no fantastic. Doubt. It was the, it was the ideal liberal arts experience, especially in the sense that I really got to know uh, my professors and one professor there, his name's Harlan Beckley. Uh, and he's, he's still active. He's still writing. Uh, turns out he is what's called a theological ethicist. And again, I didn't really know what those two words together meant, um, but he was teaching a course on poverty issues. And it was there that I really started to, to wonder about sort of the, the foundation and the basis of not only particular values, you know, like caring for the poor or justice, uh, but but the foundation of value itself, the foundation mm. of saying that there is good and evil and that those are concepts that correspond with something real in the world. And it was because of, of his influence throughout the, the four uh, years that I was in college that not only I discovered that there was something called a theology to study, um, but that I really wanted to, uh, to study it. So that, that's sort of the, the academic path uh, that I took. I, then I went to, um, after I graduated from college, I ended up at Yale Divinity School and then at the University of Chicago for the PhD, uh, and uh, in both of those degrees were in religious ethics. Uh, but there's also a personal track as well. Uh, as I said, I, I grew up Catholic, and I never had any issues with growing up Catholic. We were certainly a minority community in northeastern Oregon, sure, a, uh, primarily Mormon community. Um, Mormon and uh, and uh, mainline Protestant denominations were the the main communities. But it was a it's a very idyllic place to, to grow up. Um, and I always took my faith seriously in the sense that I, uh, I, I believed in it, but it was, it was still pretty superficial. 
And that even remained as, uh, as I was, as I began to study it, I really got attracted to the ideas, to the great thinkers, to the arguments, but my personal engagement, uh, remained, remained sort of on the surface, uh, until later in life. I'm about, uh, boy, how old am I now? 41. Uh, just a few years ago, in fact, I sort of had a, I had a, a period, an extended period in my life of, of great challenges. And it was there I realized sort of do or die and I'm either in or I'm out. And I decided to go in. So, so this is both a, a personal and professional uh, vocation for me. Wow. That, and by the way, if you can marry those two things, that's, that's an incredible feat. Yeah. Um, that's, that is incredible. And, and I think, you know, it, it's interesting because, because I'm Mormon. I, that's how I was raised. And, and so I can relate a little bit to some of the things that you're, you're saying, uh-huh. both in, in, as far as, you know, living in the community, you know, um, you know, that, that has kind of a, re, a, a religious basis, um, which we're seeing less and less of, I think. Absolutely, and, and, yeah. and as well as, as, you know, the culture of whatever religion you belong to kind of uh, getting in the way, <laughs> if you will, of the, of the actual, um, you know, theology, the actual ideas and the actual, you know, same grace that, that, you know, has that that's in store for us if, if we do go all in, if, if you will. That's right. That's right. So that's, that's really interesting. What, um, so, so talk with me a little bit about this book on, on Jordan Peterson, God and Christi- Christianity. It's, it's interesting, you know, um, and, and it's, it's almost superficial to call Jordan Peterson a, a self-help author, <laughs> but it, it, in some ways he can be, but, but you don't often see popular authors and, um, you know, engaging with the scholarly community. And, and so I'm curious about, you know, why, what is it about Jordan Peterson that makes him different than, um, you know, other authors or other, um, uh, figures that, that we have in, in popular society? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, th- I think that the way that you set it up just with the, the whole genre of self-help literature, which is, as you know, it's huge. I mean, if you go into a, a bookstore, there's a whole section devoted to, to self-help. I think, I think the first thing to note there is, is how peculiar that really is in a sense, because it's, um, when I was uh, younger, uh, I got to do some traveling right after, right after college. And uh, a lot of that traveling, I got to stay for extended periods of time in some very poor parts of the world. And um, the whole concept of self-help for, for vast swaths of humanity would be, would be comical, alien to the point of barely intelligible in the sense that, one, I have, the, I have the time to be able to think about what self-help might mean, and two, that I would need it in, uh, in, in, in the first sense, that I, I am a project. I am both the subject and object of my own project. That's a very... Uh, not only uh, Western, but I would say contemporary understanding of what the self is, that the self helps the self. And uh, put in the right light, I'd say it's also profoundly uh, different, even in, uh, even in contradiction to, to the Christian anthropology, the Christian understanding of the self. Yeah. So within that whole strange genre, I think Jordan Peterson can broadly fit in there, but he also, he also breaks the genre in a very important way. One of the, um, one of the things that most fascinated me about Jordan Peterson when I first uh, began to to listen to his uh, to his work online, like that's how you know so many people found him, is just how willing he is to say things that are true but that we don't want to hear. Yeah, uh, and I think that that's one of the if I could you know play armchair psychologist, I think that's one of the the major issues with our culture nowadays is that we have embrace this idea of self-help, of the self being a project that the self works on, but have completely abandoned any criteria of what a good self might be and said, mm-hmm. well, you know what? The self gets to determine what is good for the self. And that sounds good on paper, but it's a nightmare. It's a disaster when it's actually put in process, in, in practice, because that's why, 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 when you, when you start thinking it through, why does that become a disaster? Well, I, I think there's there's some deep uh, philosophical questions embedded here, but just sort of the, my my initial response would be is if I knew the problem that I needed to fix, then I would just fix it, right? I mean that's the whole that's the whole curiosity of the self help genre is wait a minute if I'm the one who needs to help myself, why don't I just help myself? Like why don't I just do it already and be done with it and be happy? 
But that's the problem is I don't know when I'm in this silo of secularism, I don't know what it is that I even want, even less how it is I'm supposed to achieve what I want. And so I'm trapped in this kind of interior, destructive, vicious circle of self-referential uh, consultation that just ends up in disaster, especially when it's socialized across an entire or, world. Or you start setting up idols, you know, like, you know, Elon Musk or, you know, people that you admire that turn into, you know, all, almost, you know, religion or, or, or um, you know, presidents or, or you, you put these people up that you think that's what you want, but, you know, are, are kind of false idols in a, in a real way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are the two options, right? If, if you remove God as, uh, as the, the ultimate object of your concern and the ultimate goal that you seek to realize in your life, then you're left with two options, either yourself. So either you idolize yourself or you idolize something in the world. Either way, by definition, it's going to be an idol because it's not God. Mm. Right. Right. That, um, and, and it's interesting, like when I, when I first, one of the things that, that I, I think I came across Jordan Peterson in the same way most people came with, with some of his, um, the stand he took, which I think was admirable and, and necessary um, from a standpoint of, of like, it, it didn't, it almost didn't matter where that stand was, but the, the fact that he was willing to take it so publicly and so willingly and yeah. at, 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 you know, potentially great sacrifice. Um but I, I do remember as I, I was kind of listening to some of his talks and listening to some of his lectures, you know, one of the things he said was, was um, uh, talking about victimization. And he would say, you're a victim and you're a victim and we're all victims. And, 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 then, and then he would have the brashness to, to bring up Christ and saying, you know, the, 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 West, the, the person that is foremost in our Western culture, Christ himself was the ultimate victim. So, you know, how can we say we're above that essentially was the, the, just what I was saying. And for somebody um, in a, in a, um, uh, in the context of a college lecture to talk probably more boldly than, you know, my preacher would, (laughs) you know, it it was quite a thing to see. I think, I think that, yeah, personally, in terms of his character, in terms of particular charism. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's why so many of us are also drawn to him is, is he, he's, he's courageous. And you rarely see courage uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a public setting. I know there's acts of courage happening all the time that are invisible to, to most people. Um, but in terms of, of being, being in, a, in a public setting, on a, on a public stage, and willing to say things that will not only get you pushback, but will stir the pot in such a way where the forces who like the things that the way they are will come after you and they will not stop. He, of course, he knew that going into this, and the truth for him was more important than the the consequences of of, of angering the uh, the secular deities. Which which comes back to to your book. I like uh, now, why why a book about him and his relationship to God and Christianity? Why did you feel that that was a, a something that needed to be addressed? Yeah, well, I think there, there's there's at least two sides to it. One is. Um, Jordan Peterson, uh, and this is just empirically the case, he's reaching millions and millions of people across the world uh, who have, in one way or another, either abandoned the idea of religion or are at least so skeptical of it uh, that they, they don't really take it seriously as, as, a, as a category of serious intellectual engagement. And, and he has, I think, opened the door for those vast swaths of humanity in primarily the, 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 the developed world uh, to take religion seriously again, and not only religion in general, but biblical religion and Christianity in particular. And so the, the book, uh, my co-author Christopher uh, Kayser and I, we, we want to talk to that audience as well, say, look, you're interested in Jordan Peterson for a very good reason. Uh, here's the substructure to what he's arguing about the nature of morality, about the nature of nature, about the nature of humanity. Here's, here's the, the basement to the basement of his own thinking, and here where this, where, where this comes from. At the same time, I think there's a Christian critique to be made of his work as well, to show areas where there's inconsistencies, where it's not complete, where it leads to consequences that perhaps even he doesn't want his thought to lead to. 
So speaking to that audience, we say, well, look, here's Christianity uh, and here's how it completes and and corrects the project that you have brilliantly thought yourself into. That's to, to Peterson's audience on one side. The other side is to is to to devout the Christians, so those who take their faith seriously, uh, those who um, for whom faith is at the center of their life. Uh, there is, and uh, you know, I've already seen this in, in some of the, uh, the the Facebook reactions to uh, to the book. You know, there's there's a, a fair amount of them who are very suspicious of of Jordan Peterson, uh, and oftentimes will take you know one thing or two things that he said in a particular time and and seek to say, well, no, this is not a trustworthy figure. And to them, I think our our goal as co-authors is to say, look, this man, whether or not he's a Christian right now, we actually can't tell. It's it's actually very, he's in a very ambiguous period, right. as far as we can see from the outside. But look at what he has done for Christianity, and look at what we have done for Christianity, and let's do a comparative analysis. <laughs> Who's reaching right. more people, and yeah. who is converting, as it were, more people to a kind of basic theism? Well, it, it and, and I don't want to overstate it, but it does remind me a little bit of a John the Baptist kind of guy of of like here's this guy in the wilderness outside of the the the, the world of of religiosity and in, in what we would normally talk about, and all of a sudden he has all of these converts and all of these people following him, some of which may think he's the Messiah himself, <laughs> and you know, um, you know, and it's, like it, that. That's a good you know, it's it's a, it, to me it's an interesting like like gathering point um uh, and because he does he he speaks you know Nietzsche just as easily as he speaks Matthew it's really yeah. he's such an interesting character and he is I, I don't want to call him coy because I think he's honest in his assessment and, and what he's trying to figure out um but he has maintained some bit of ambigu- <laughs> ambiguous to, to like who he really is and and you know what he's trying to to do it's very interesting yeah, well, I think, again, this is all sort of from what, how much can we actually know from the outside, but he does give us quite a bit to to, to see in terms of, of his own uh, personal approach to, you know, whether he's going to convert or not. Um, I, I think that his, it, what appears from what he said, and of course, I don't know Jordan Peterson personally, but it appears from what he said online, uh, is that one of his biggest hangups is that he takes the, he takes it seriously, meaning like, if I become a follower of Christ, Right. Therefore, I have to completely change my whole life, which has echoes of, of uh, the St. Augustine in it as well during his own conviction. I mean, I can't just this isn't just an intellectual switching of categories from uh, from uh, tepid belief to full belief. It is a total revolution of life, which means a total revolution of my moral life as well. And I don't know if I'm ready for that. And I think that, too, points to just that. Are we taking our faith as seriously as right. Mark Peterson from the outside is taking our faith? Yeah, no, that I think that that's a that's a fair that's a fair question, and again, it kind of talks to the, you know, the what he speaks to. And one thing I think we can certainly say, um, I think I'll say it is that he is for sure a cultural Christian. In other words, he was raised in a culture. He was raised in 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 the ideas of Christianity. He he grew up in the Western world, like we all have, like, like those of us who are probably listening to this podcast have. And so we, even, even if we're non-believers or if we um, don't subscribe to a specific, we're one of the nuns out there, for example, um, you know, we still live in a world that is Christian dominant as far as uh, if nothing else, a certain part of ethics is is concerned. And, and I wonder, um, you know, you know, does, does 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 somebody come up with these same ideas if if they're um, you know living in a different part of the world or a different time? I mean, it's it's a very interesting idea of of, of how his thought process has, has worked himself into this this place he's at. Yeah, well, there's there's so many layers to that observation. I think it's I think it's great. Um, what, one of them is the, the sort of a theological layer, and that's you know for Christians, especially if you're thinking about the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus Christ is the Logos incarnate. And, and what that means, I mean, it means many things, but what that means in a basic sense is that anywhere you encounter truth in existence, you are encountering Christ to a limited but real degree. You're not encountering the fullness of Christ, but you're encountering the real Christ. And so just from a sort of a theological and to use a fancy word, epistemic standpoint in terms of like how we can know what we can know, um, Christ is knowable in human rationality and in the world itself from a Christian perspective. Now, 
different doctrines of sin can 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 change the interpretation of what that means in particular. But theoretically speaking, anybody should be able to sort of think himself or herself into Christian territory, even from the perspective of just revelation and uh, and the gospels. With regards to Christian culture, I think I think it's right. I think Jordan Peterson probably, if we you know did a sociological analysis of the area that he grew up in and and his particular influences, we'd find that Christianity had an influence in sort of setting the cultural milieu of, in which he was growing up. But here's the thing: I mean, I I don't know if we are a Christian culture anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly, there's pockets of it uh, throughout the United States and throughout the West. But if we had to do like a an analysis where we had to come down on one side or the other in terms of what most people think and how most people live their lives. I think the ta- the, the, the scales might have already tipped over to the to the pagan <laughs> side again. Well, that that very well could be true, and 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 maybe that's you know all the more reason uh, that that we need somebody like Jordan Peterson yeah. right now. It's um, it, interesting. I, I, I as I was looking at your book, you have it um, divided into, into two separate sections that that both you and your co-author um, has has taken on board where. Um, Christopher has kind of taken the, in my opinion, kind of the easy side, of, <laughs> if there is one, of, of, of talking about his lectures on the Bible, which were fascinating. I mean, those were incredible. Um, and then maybe, you know, digging into those, you, you took his, his 12 rules for life more as the, um, you know, as the, 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 the book that, that you're going to use to, to write your section. Um, talk about your ideas on organizing the book and, and why you decided to, to go that route. And, and what were some of your, um, you know, initial, what, 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 uh, what am I trying to ask? What maybe surprised you or what were you about 12 rules for life specifically? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I actually, I owe Chris, Chris is a, not only a co-author, he's a good friend of mine. He was really the one who first really introduced me into uh, into Jordan Peterson, and um, uh, it, it's it's because of him that uh, that I even got into his thought uh, at all. I mean, I had heard about him, but you know, you hear lots of names tossed around online. Uh, but but Chris had already begun to to engage his thought, and one of the insights that Chris had early on was, and this is this is before Jordan Peterson went through his his, his great trial of, of, of suffering, and even before a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, the political hubbub around his, his presence, uh, on the world stage, um, is on the one hand, Chris is recognizing that, uh, that he's, you know, deeply engaged with the Christian tradition, but on the other hand, it's recognizing, but there, there's so many gaps, uh, there's so many holes right. that, that it appears that Jordan Peterson doesn't realize, uh, would, would fill in his thought in such a way. So we began talking about, uh, how we might approach his thought in light of the influence that he was having on the culture. And so um, Chris had already started working on his biblical lectures in terms of, of writing shorter articles on, on their meaning and then how Christianity completes them. And so I said, well, I'll take a, I'll take a look at the actual, um, actual book itself. And just sort of organically, it worked out where these two sides, I think, really, really complement each other. Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking to, to Matthew Petrusic. Uh, he's the co-author with uh, Christopher Kaz. Uh, Kaiser, is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. Kaiser. Um, Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity. Um, a really fascinating book. I, I'd really recommend you go to wordonfire.org and, and check out that, that book. It's, um, it is, uh, I think you'll get a lot of insight. Let, let's talk, delve a little bit into what maybe you guys see as gaps or as, um, you know, inc- incorrect assumptions. What are some things that you, you, you're critical of Peterson and, and his thoughts? Yeah, I think well, one um, one of the biggest areas is in Peterson's metaphysics, and I know that word when most people hear it, and I would include myself as most people <laughs> in this case. Yeah. When you hear the word metaphysics, you're like, "Oh no, <laughs> I'm not I'm gonna shut right. that or I'm not walking down that path <laughs> because it's only going to lead to, at best, confusion; at worst, very severe boredom." So yeah. let's let's not talk about metaphysics. On the other hand, metaphysics is sort of the most important thing you can talk about. Why? Because if you have your metaphysics wrong, and what I mean by wrong is if, if, it, if you're describing a reality that is not actually real, then every other thing that you do within that false reality is going to, is going to be tinged with the, 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 the first lie or the first falsity. 
right? And, and we, I think we particularly see this now in, in secular culture with this claim that I can create my own reality. Right? That I am, I am in a sense a God and I can, I, I can right. define nature how I want to define it. I can define the human body how I want to define it. I can define happiness as I want to define it. Nature is infinitely malleable according to my own will. Well, that's metaphysically untenable. I mean, it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense, right? Because the condition for the possibility of me being able to create the world according to my own will is my own existence, of which I have no control. Over most of what defines me as me in terms of being alive and existing, I have no control. So there's this root error in the contemporary understanding of the self that just permeates everything up and through politics. And so in order to really address what's really going on and to, to, to fix it, we have to go into metaphysical territory. Right. And I think one of the issues with Peterson's metaphysics is, at least as, as I see it laid out in, um, in 12 Rules for Life and Beyond Order, is that he appears to be, and I say appears because it, it's not always exactly clear what particular metaphysical claim he's making, but it appears to be that he sees a kind of dualism to existence at, at an ultimate level, that, there's, that there are forces of good and there is a goodness in reality itself but that there's also forces of evil and that those forces of evil kind of have a, to use the fancy word, an ontological equality, meaning they're, they're, they're kind of half of existence and they're in this right. cosmic struggle. So this is, this is the, the yin and the yang, right? This is yeah. the idea of goodness pushing against evil and evil pushing against goodness. And then there being a little bit of evil and goodness and a little bit of goodness and evil sort of comic book territory. And it's, it's a very interesting metaphysics, but Christianity rejects it wholesale. I mean, that is like the, that, that was one of the, the, the early Christian debates, right, is, is how do we conceive of the goodness of God and the presence of evil? Very early on in the development of Christianity, I'd say it's even in scripture itself, is no, everything is fundamentally good. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that evil exists, and here I'd speak particularly about moral evil, is because human beings create a lie out of the truth. So we create a shadow reality. Now, why is that important? That sounds really abstract. It's important because it sets up the right foundation for how to understand who we are as human beings and how we can address evil in the world. Because if I see evil as this sort of constant uh, uh, presence that has its own independent reality, I'm going to fight it in a very different way right. than if I see evil as a shadow reality that's only real because I and humanity as a whole has brought it into existence. Well, it, it also area. It also puts God in a very interesting perspective because all of a sudden God is not the, you know, the 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 bringer of all that is good, our father, the somebody who loves us and and but but almost as a Zeus character, yep. you know, going up against, you know, a going pantheon. against this, this yeah, exactly. And and that and that becomes very not certainly not not what the scriptures teach us that's for sure yeah and it's and it's philosophically uh to use a word favored among academics problematic uh, because <laughs> if there are dueling gods then it appears there'd have to be a third god who oversees the tension between the the two, the two dueling gods yeah uh, and then and then a fourth god who oversees that god so it's the i mean saint thomas aquinas uh saint augustine as well deal with this question sort of it very early in their theologies. It just doesn't make sense. It's either one God or no God. And so to, uh, to, to create a theological landscape in which there are warring deities, philosophically speaking, doesn't, it doesn't make much sense. Yeah. Well, and I, I also, um, you know, maybe to, to change it a little bit, I, I, one of the things that I've always thought about um, Peterson is he is very rooted in um uh, science. I'm not going to say he uh, scientism because he rejects that. I think he does boy. reject scientism. Yeah. But but he but he is he does believe in evolution uh, from what I can gather, and he believes in in um, uh, psychological evolution, which is an interesting thing to me that and, and kind of Jungian in the idea that like somehow um, you know uh, these uh, even. A moral ethics and and things have been passed down through the generations and have grown, and that always confused me because if that were the case, and then I'm wondering why do we even need religion if they're passed down through our genes? I don't get that, but but it seems to be kind of the the the, the train. 
I guess in lieu of saying there's a God that has, that has, you know, um, created us and has, you know, given us the gift of free will and has, has allowed us to, um, you know, make mistakes. And at the same time, it has taught us his rules and his law, you know, in lieu of that, it has to be this kind of uh, Darwin, <laughs> you know, idea of, 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 of evolution passing ethics on from one per, one generation to the next. And why do we need church then? I, that, bo- that bothers me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, um, the, I think that cuts back to the, to the metaphysical question is, so l- let's say, let's say that yeah, there is a, just, we're just going to appeal to some kind of Darwinian understanding of, of, uh, let, let's just specify to morality. Um, that the reason that life and then spec- specifying human life has particular kinds of inclinations that we might call moral uh, is because it helps the survival of the group. And by helping the survival of the group, it helps the survival of an individual. So it, it all comes back to survival and reproduction. I think you can get quite a bit of mileage out of that insight, um, but it hits, a, it hits a philosophical wall pretty quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's that, okay, so you look in human beings and you see all sorts of tendencies. And those tendencies include uh, tendencies towards what we might call altruism, generosity, empathy, the ability to, to imagine oneself being another person. And um, those tendencies could potentially be interpreted to say, well, look, if I can imagine this person being me and I can, and I can imagine myself being that person, then maybe we can create a society in which we can both reproduce better and live longer. Fine. But then you come to the question of, well, why? But why should I do that? Because right. the very same evolutionary tendency that gave me the ability to imagine myself as another person also gave me the ability to make a calculation how to kill somebody in a sleep. I mean, to put it bluntly, right? Yeah. So I could just, I could use the same tendencies within my nature writ large as a human being to play on people's uh, foolish naivetes about, you know, being valued for being human and being human alone. So I could make them think that I agree with them in order to manipulate society and to make myself king, at which point I get to have as much reproduction, as much survival as I want, at least temporarily. So this very same Darwinian uh, understanding of morality cuts both ways. Sure, it can be understood as, uh, as, as creating social communities that are peaceful. It can also be understood as creating the worst tyrants in history, both of them. So then you need a principle that comes, an external principle to nature that comes along and says, do this, not that. And that principle cannot be reduced to nature itself. It must be external to it, extrinsic to it, which is another way of saying we need a natural law and uh, and a God who grounds it. That's really that. That's exactly right in my mind. That, that sounds sounds right to me. At least that's that's fantastic. Um, one of the things that that um, you write, um, and I think this this actually kind of cuts to the core of why um, Christians should pay attention to this. Um, is is you're talking is uh, I don't have the page because I'm on Kindle, but um, uh, you talk about two loves and one God, and and you say how can one assess this remarkable proposal from someone who will not commit to be believing in God yet exhorts everyone to choose Christ over Satan? Um, in other words, choosing the uh, and you talked about this before, choosing the 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 sacrifice, the the good of others um, versus the self. Um, doing what's right for God versus doing what's right for, for the self. Um, so why, why should somebody with a Christian background, why, um, why should somebody pay attention to somebody who doesn't profess Christianity <laughs> to, um, you know, to say we need to pay attention to Christ? Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's a great question. I think, well, as again, as I understand Peterson and, and again, I think, I think Peterson, one of the great, great traits of, of many great traits that I think he has is that he, he thinks out loud. And so he's thinking through these things. Mm-hmm. He's not trying to present himself in such a way where he's immune from, from criticism. And he, he completely understands absolutely everything. And so he's just delivering the truth from on high. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think that you get to see a kind of organic, right. he doesn't give you that guru sense. sense no, at all. not at all. And that is, that is rare and amazing about, uh, about his work. Um, and so I think one of the areas that that I think we can critique his thought on, but and maybe he would agree with, is that 
the case he's making for why be good and why follow Christ for him, the, the symbolic Christ, but maybe not, maybe he does mean the real Christ, <laughs> is because life will be better for you. Like you, will, you will be able to avoid, no, that's too strong. You won't be able to avoid catastrophe. You will be able to weather catastrophe in such a way that, as he would put it, I think, it won't destroy you or it won't turn you into somebody who will destroy others. I, I think love that's, his, that's true. Yeah, I loved his, his, his take when he, when he did his, his lecture on Noah and he talked about, you know, the idea of being the perfect father. In other words, it, being the person that, that if your father were to pass away, that people could count on you being the strong one to, to take care of things and not fall apart while everything else is falling apart around you. I, and I think that's a, that's a beautiful insight. Uh, and I, 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 I imagine if we did again, and actually there is some empirical data on this, that people who live according to the precepts, the general precepts of what it means to be a Christian tend to be happier in the, in the ways that we can measure happiness. Uh, right. And there should, in a sense, be nothing surprising about that when you actually look at the precepts themselves. So, so in a utilitarian sense, um, I think Peterson's on to something. But then the question is, is but well, look, if I'm acting according to these precepts because I think on the whole it's going to help me and others suffer less, don't I care if they're true or not? I mean, ultimately, I want to know whether or not the way that I've oriented my life is is based upon something real. And I think that's well, I the think he would say yeah. they're true enough when he when he say, well, they're true enough. You know, I yeah, I think he would. I think that's right. I don't I don't think that's a I don't think truth at its core comes in degrees. I mean, it's either the case that there is meaning and purpose to a human existence, or it's the case that there is no meaning and purpose to existence. Now we could say within those, within the category of there is meaning and purpose, we could then specify what it is. And perhaps there's degrees there, but at the core, it's either a zero and a one or a one, either there is a, a real, either there is God or there isn't God. And so to say something true enough is to say something like, well, there's, there's, there's partially a God or there, there, there's partially uh, meaning to the world. And I think, again, that's that metaphysical question. If it's a zero at the bottom, then everything Peterson says is just as arbitrary as, as what anybody else says. Right. On the other hand, if there is a one at the bottom, if there is a, a fundamental existence that structures all the rest of existence, now we can understand, A, why it's so useful to follow those 12 rules, and B, what it would mean to complete those 12 rules, what they're grounded in and where they're headed. Mm. That's interesting. That's good. Um, I think also one of the one of the benefits of having this kind of more um, it's almost an earthy theology in a way, um, it, which is kind of weird. But but he but so many times that when I've talked to Christians and they they've you know kind of expressed their you know why somebody should become a Christian for whatever reason, um, a lot of times they'll say something to the effect of, well, you know. What you know? What, what's the, what's the worst case scenario? If you die and you're not a Christian, you're going to hell. If you if you die and you're and there is no God, then and you are a Christian and you live in, then you know you didn't lose any out. It's it, the yeah. best case scenario is that you can go to heaven. And what I like about what what Jordan Peterson is saying is it's not just about going to heaven. In fact, I, I've really come to the conclusion that that most of God's commandments and most, if not all, of the things He's teaching is about us living a good life here and has nothing to do with going to heaven. Um, and I think that, that um, you know, one of the things I think Jordan Peterson has kind of pointed out is that is what you just said, that this idea of living a good life in itself um, is a good and can lead us to that, that one at the bottom that, that, that you talked about. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And there's these, um, and I, th I think secular secularism has a, a lot to do with this, but also what I would just say some so some forms of of Christianity or, or some sort. Let me put it this way: some forms of uh, of Christian belief um, that set it up as a kind of um, false false duality or false mutual exclusivity. So it's like either we have religion in order to cope with life, so it's like a psychological crutch. Yeah, uh, and so religion is is entirely a, a strategy for waiting until you die, or religion is just about the afterlife. Um, and the reality is, and this is evident from I mean from the scriptures themselves, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, especially the, the grand arc of them together, is that no, it's about both. It's about you live according to 
the right structures of reality, which we could call the law, and you're going to do all, all said and done, you're going to do well in life in the, the totality of what wellness means. You're going to be okay. Yeah. You're not going to, to crumble. Okay. You're going to suffer. You're going to feel pain. You're going to, uh, to go through extensive periods of darkness, but you will be okay because you're living according to the nature of reality itself. And you will, through that process, become the kind of person, so long as you're faithful to the, to, to living according to the truth, to somebody who will become uh, perfected according to your nature by the grace of God. That's another way of saying you'll go to heaven. So it's, right. you don't have to make these, these two choices. And I do think that Peterson does his, his thought does err on the first side of just saying, look, this is a coping mechanism. We don't really need to think about heaven um, because all we need to do is to, 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 to get through life. And I think that's another area of his thought that, um, that is incomplete. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. What, um, what is your, here's another interesting thing about Peterson that is also unusual in my mind is his, um, acceptance or even, um, he, he sees a need for rites and rituals, um, that you really don't see in any other kind, like I said, a guru or something like, like you don't see the, somebody saying, you know, there, there's, there's importance to these rituals of, of, um, you know, the last supper or, or you know, uh, of, of the Lord's supper of, of sacraments. Uh, these things are actually important to our lives. And, um, and he seems to embrace that more than, more than I would think he would. Yeah. Well, I think he's, being grounded in science in the in the scientific method as he is um i think gives him a theological advantage in a way that he he may not e- even be completely aware of precisely because he's not he's not as far as we know deeply embedded within a, a christian tradition at least yet uh and that's that science is all about materiality right it's about it's about the world as it exists according to um, the, the the physical structures of reality and and how all of that's put together. So in that sense, he's deeply embedded in stuff. That is a really important, especially from uh, from my own tradition, from the Catholic tradition. That's like incredibly important to realize. Why? Because Jesus Christ is not an ideal. He's not. He's not a principle. He's God made flesh, and so the very bodily nature of Christ. And you see this all throughout, not only Catholic thought, but if you walk into a Catholic church, at least one of the older ones, unfortunately, some of the newer buildings have have lost this, but the older ones, you see stuff everywhere. And the idea is not that this stuff is God. I mean, that's one of, that's one of the, the, the the false claims that's oftentimes made about Catholic belief that, uh, that we worship statues and things like that. No, 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 no. It's that this stuff is a vehicle for encountering God, that God is not just this disembodied idea, this transcendent reality that we can only access through the mind, which would be a heresy. That would be what's called Gnosticism. But rather, God is the transcendent ideal, is the transcendent being, and he is Emmanuel, God among us. And so I think Peterson has latched on in 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 a very helpful way to that idea that we are bodily creatures, like we're made up of stuff and we have a nature to us. We are made in a particular kind of way. And that way that we are made inclines us to interact with stuff in such a way that if we do it right, we become more whole. We become more complete. So the sacraments, the architecture, the art, things that, are, that we can access through our senses become vehicles for touching the divine. And so, again, I think, I think that's implicit in Peterson's thought, but boy, if it could just be embedded within a proper sacramental theology, I think right. it, I think it would it would just it would just be complete. <laughs> it's and it's so, and it does remind me of my own my own faith and and I'll, I'll give you an example. I uh, you know f- uh, several years ago is it's when I first encountered uh, Bishop Barron. He was Father Barron at the time, and was really really impressed. And I saw a um, a, a lecture that he gave. I believe is called something like. Um, you know, uh, Christ, prophet, priest, king, something, oh, yeah. something yeah. of that nature. Yeah, and it was it really touched me. Um, specifically, the the Catholic teaching on on the um, on communion, um, on the Lord's Supper, 
and you uh, great gave incredible insight and meaning to my own church life and my own uh, rituals that that we do every week in, in partaking of bread and, and water and 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 uh, as the sacrament and it it made me realize how important it is to realize that it's, you know, God giving himself up as a sacrifice, not just as, to the world as an idea, but to me as an individual. Yeah. Um, and that that can become that that godliness can become a part of me if I allow it. Yeah. Um, and, and it's it's those kinds of things that it, it kind of breaks my heart um, that that. And, and I, I, I'm going to talk superficially. I'm going to talk generally, but it seems to me that, that the Christian world has really um, dumbed down a lot of its theology and has pushed people away because of it. Like we don't, we think with our hearts, which I think we, I think we need to use our hearts, but we don't think enough with our brains because when questions come, we don't have answers and we don't have these principles like communion, like these, like the, like, um, um, you know, God being um, just these principles that, that we've talked about today. If we don't have these embedded into our souls, that it becomes uh, easy to fall away and be, to become a nun, for example. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think Jesus uh, both identifies and predicts that. And by he, the way, when I say nun, I mean not not associated with the church. <laughs> with oh, any yeah. church. <laughs> no, I should probably clarify that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if, as you know, that that word is so uh, is so commonly known now within certain circles. But yeah, if right. we haven't heard the word nun, <laughs> um, but yeah, Jesus. I mean, Jesus says that in one of his parables, right, with the parable of the seeds that that fall on the ground, and you know, some seeds fall on the ground and they they immediately die. Some take root and then they're scorched by the sun sun some are taken away by uh, external forces and some grow into great uh, into into great trees that then mu- the, the mustard seed right that then give shelter to to others and of course we could pick apart that all day in terms of, of extracting its wisdom but what one of the the base teachings there is look, you have to set up your life right in order to receive the fullness of God's grace not because God, is you know sort of doling out grace and waiting for you to do the right thing, but that we build so many structures around ourselves to block the light, as it were, that if we don't remove those structures in the proper way and keep them down, then we're blocking the light. It has nothing to do with God's will. It has to do with our will. And so we have to structure our lives properly. It's not just mental structuring. It's not just like, do I have the right ideas? Because having the right ideas is important, but it will lead to just total failure in life if you can't live according to them uh, consistently. So how how do we how do we structure our day? This gets into prayer and and the the kinds of ways that we spend our time. How do we how do I treat my own body? Right? How do I understand my body? How do I understand the nature around me? All those things have to be in the right place in order to grow into the kind of tree that's going to be healthy and to be able to provide shade for all. Again, I think that Peterson gets that an implicit level. <laughs> he he needs that he needs the he needs to well, finalize it. That's it's, it's like he needs to make it live. It, it's interesting. It's it's cuz what you're saying like I just hear echoes of, you know, get your, you know, clean up your room. Yes, exactly. of, you know, um, you know, get your house in order before you go out and try to fix other people. So you know, all these things are just oh, I, that, that's what he's saying. But you're right. There's there needs to be that that living water that that kind of enlivens the source yeah. words. Yeah. So um, again, we're talking to uh, Matthew Petrusik, uh, excuse me, and I'm really grateful for your time. We're coming, we're coming a bit to the end. But before I finish up, um, is there um, we can find the book at wordonfire.org. Um, talk about uh, um, what's maybe your your give us a final takeaway on on Jordan Peterson, how you how you view him, and um, you know maybe um, if he reads your book, what what do you hope that he gains from it? Yeah, I think um, the first thing I want to say is, is again, I don't know him. I, I've never, I've never uh, spoke with him. So this is all from from having watched his material, like that, the same material everybody else has access to. But I want to say that I, I admire him. Uh, he he is courageous in ways that I hope I would be cre- courageous in certain certain circumstances. But then I have my doubts that I would. We can look at Jordan Peterson and see somebody who is willing to live according to. To stay, at least let me put it this way, at least to state the truth as the truth, 
whatever consequences may follow. And if we could all do that, because we live in a period not of just lies. I mean, there's always saturated with lies in our individual life, in the lives of our families, in our individual communities, and up to global. Like We're always saturated in, in falsehoods. But I think it's, it's fair to say, it's justified to say, that we live in a time period now in which there are such obvious lies that um, have taken over major institutions, have taken over massive swaths of the culture. And they're only there, not because we don't know that they're not lies, but because we're scared of the consequences of saying that they are lies. And I think Jordan Peterson uh, is an example. He's a moral exemplar in that particular sense of saying, that doesn't make sense. That's not true. It's false what you're saying. And, and using the power of no, right? We have all these self-help books with the power of yes. How about the power of no once in a while? <laughs> right. And so I think I think I just I just want to say he, he is a, a really exemplary figure of moral courage. What I hope that people get out of this book is one to to see an appreciation of of his thought, an appreciation of his mind. And at the same time, not a but, but an and, and see how the project that he has created and he is working on has a ground and a goal that's grounded, that, that is the, the biblical God, that is Jesus Christ, not as an ideal or an archetype, but as God becoming man to, to save us. And so I, I hope in that sense, it, it has an evangelical uh, function to it. Say, look, if you're interested in Jordan Peterson and you follow the train of his thought, let me introduce you to another book here. I, and by that, I mean the Bible. Right. <laughs> not, not Bible. <laughs> I, should, I should have completed that. that was... <laughs> I got this great book, Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and I think, um, you know, it, it, it reminds me of the, the um, of C.S. Lewis, you know, talking about, you know, great art and the longing of art and why we long for art and uh, for great art because it, it we're actually it's actually pointing us to the real deal the real thing and yeah and how you know and i think in the same way you know if we can if we can understand the principles that jordan peterson is is talking about um you know if we take that to the end the hope is that it will lead to the to the real god the the real principles that that will save us that's right. That's right. And, and, and there's a just in biblical language, right? There's a promise and, and the promise is, is made by God. And that promise is, is I will be with you. I am here till the end of the age. But what, but what is the condition for that promise? This is the last book, the last words of the, of the gospel of Matthew, right? Go out into the world, meaning follow me and I'm with you. And again, that's not, that's not God imposing conditions in such a way where he's a jealous deity. And if you don't love me, then I'm not going to love you back. It's like false. That has nothing to do with the biblical conception of right. God, even though you hear that all the time for people who've never actually read the Bible. <laughs> it is that this is how you will be happy. Yeah. This is how you will be whole. I can't do that for you. It's like a parent to a child, right? I want you to be happy. I can't make you happy. This is how you can be happy if you freely choose it. That's wonderful. I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, Matthew Petrusek, thank you so much for your valuable time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. It's a good conversation. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I hope everybody will pick up your book um, with uh, Christopher Kayser. The book is Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity. God bless you. And, and I, I look forward to having another conversation in the future, I hope. Likewise. Likewise. God bless you, too. This has been Mike Levitt, and you're listening to And If Love Remains.